our, our second speaker this morning is Dr. Natalia Chalmers. Um, she, doc, uh, Dr. Chalmers received her Doctor of Dental Surgery um, degree from the Medical University of Sofia. She has a PhD and a certificate in pediatric dentistry from the University of Maryland School of Dentistry and a master's in clinical research from Duke Medical University. Uh, she's a board certified pediatric dentist uh, and diplomate of the American Board of Pediatric Dentistry. In her current position, she serves as the director of analytics and publication with the Dentist Institute. And she previously served as a pediatric dentist and clinical research fellow at NIDCR. Um, she's a, also a fellow uh, with the Pediatric Oral Health Research and Policy Center and a consultant for the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry Council on Scientific Affairs. Uh, she has an extensive resume and it's my pleasure today to introduce Dr. Natalia Chalmers. Please welcome. Her. Good morning, everyone. Did everyone enjoy the wonderful hospitality of San Antonio? Had a, had a great dinner. I hope uh, you were able to enjoy some of the local tastes of San Antonio. Okay, let's find our presentation. seems to take longer than one. All right, you can see this, and I can see this. This is great. That's great. Uh, thank you for this kind introduction. I would like to thank the um, organizing committee for the invitation. And uh, it's been a great uh, day and a half uh, already. And I really uh, look forward to building on what the other presenters have already shared and give you some examples of how, now that we know what this big data is, how do we put it into action and give you some examples of how we've been able to do this at the Lentaquest Institute. Oh, uh, sometimes these things that I've done matter, but today I wanted to start with uh, a recognition of my beloved PhD mentor, uh, Paul Cohenbrander. How many recognize him uh, or know of him? If you ever took microbiology in dental school and you studied about the coagregation of different bacteria, that was the brilliance of Paul. He passed away last week, but I, I am standing here because of him, and so I wanted to, to just thank you for allowing me to pay that tribute. Okay, now we're gonna switch to our um, analytical side of the brain and talk about big data. Big data and oral health. I will give you the takeaway messages, so you're allowed to pay attention only in the next one minute. <laughs> uh, or remember them and think how they uh, in, are translated or implied in the data that I'll show you. So it is not about the data. I think someone said that yesterday, and I really love that. It. It's not about the data. It's about the stories of our patients. It's about the stories of the providers. It's why we do this. It is also um, important for us to define what these um, priority conditions are. If you just excuse me for one second, I'm going to make sure that I see the slides the same way you do. Great. Um, oh, now you don't see that. Oh, there we go. Um, it's, it's important for us to define what are the priority conditions, what matters, and why should we study it. <laughs> I think we have different ideas uh, because we come from so many different backgrounds. We need to talk about medical waste in oral health and I'll share an example of that. It's important to understand the trends um, and how big data can help us improve clinical outcomes. I wanna talk about small data. Nobody has said anything about small data. Small data is very powerful. And small data in the DentaQuest Institute we've used in our learning collaboratives Small data can drive big change. So I want to talk about the impact of small data. We need to talk about training the next generation. I think that's one reason why we're all here, to understand that this is a new area. We need you know, um, young minds to come ready to embrace dental informatics uh, and also be able to share that. And in the end of the day, if what we do is not translatable or user-friendly to either the patient, provider, the state, Whoever it is, it doesn't have a lot of meaning, right? So what if we have all this data if nobody can use it? So I want us to keep that in mind. 
So these are the, the few ideas that I'll share with you. Hopefully we have time to, to go through them. Um, the first one is big data for clinical outcomes. I'll show you an example of how big data can help us understand things that are very hard to come by unless you have this multiple randomized clinical control trial. Data for public policy, you would recognize that for sure. Medical waste with a focus on emergency department and operating costs. And data for quality, quality metrics. This came yesterday many times. Even if you wanted to do measurement, how are we going to do this? We don't have a lot of quality metrics. What is quality in the industry? And quality improvement. We may or may not ha have time to go through all of this, but these are areas of focus uh, in my department of analytics and publication. And rather than doing a very deep dive in one of them, I thought for the purpose of this conference, it would be great just to share a snippet of what's possible. And then you can take this to the next level in your own uh, research or efforts. They may look very different, but they all have this in common. It is about the triple aim. All of these have in their core the desire to improve the health of the population, improve the patient experience of care, and reduce the cost of care. But before I do this, I'm going to take two seconds and just share with you a couple of really exciting things about oral health. How many of you have known or received the last issue of Health Affairs. I see a few hands. If you haven't, this is really big. You know, oral health has never made it to Health Affairs. Uh, they're a premier journal that's read by congressmen and their aides. Um, it goes to the hands of those who actually make the policy, which is what Bruce was getting. You know, in the end of the day, after this data knowledge um, action, it's really the policy. Um, so we were very... Uh, privilege to be part, uh, included in that uh, uh, issue with my co-authors, Jane Grover and Rob Compton. Um, another plugin, sorry, if you are registered for this, how many are registered for this uh, webinar? Oh, one hand? Okay. We will have uh, 30 more people <laughs> or 40 more people. This is really exciting. Academy Health is a national health service organization uh, who also, this year for the first time, puts oral health on their agenda. And on next Tuesday, we're hosting a webinar with a hope to um, start an Academy Health Interest Group. I'm co-chairing this with Marko Vukovic from the ADA Health Policy Institute, and we have a phenomenal lineup of speakers. Um, Lisa Simpton, the CEO, Benjamin Smart, you'll see all of this, Tom, John. So these are great. This is the link, and it will be on the slides, but if you can also find me on Twitter, and it's all already there. And the last thing I wanted to mention that's related to training the next generation, for the first time Academy Health that has a delivery system science fellowship uh, is opening an oral health uh, fellowship. Okay? Our institute is going to be the host site for that. Uh, we are reviewing fellows in the next couple of weeks. So I think there is a lot of excitement of where oral health is in 2017. And um, I know all of your work will help keep that momentum going. All right, a couple of people have asked me to just say a little bit about the Institute, and I'm going to spend really a very short time just uh, stating what we do so you have an understanding. It's different from DentaQuest, which is the enterprise. The DentaQuest Institute is nonprofit, and many of you may have heard from, about the DentaQuest Foundation that funds you know, $17 million a year of philanthropy in innovative areas for uh, improvement of oral health. At the Institute, though, we are also focused on improving the oral health of all. And we live in this space here. Uh, quality improvement and technical assistance, right? You cannot ask people to improve what they do if there is a major chaos in their operational day-to-day -day system. So our technical support helps that uh, put this, you know, sort of uh, systems in place that work, and then we come in and talk about quality improvement. We know what needs to be done. The evidence is here. But there is a big discrepancy between what we know we have to do and what we actually do. And the Institute tries to close that gap. That, you know, we, we know it takes 17 years for basic evidence to be translated into clinical practice. Why should it take that long? Do we want to be here 17 years from now and talk about exactly the same issue? I hope not. Uh, so we try to close that gap by bringing the breakthrough models of the uh, Institute for Healthcare Improvement uh, strategies of how to, to drive this change. And our guest editorial in pediatric dentistry uh, in 2016 reflected a lot of the learning that's already happening through these collaboratives. 
In the end of my presentation, I'll share with you uh, f learning from uh, one of our collaborators. Okay, this is the impact map. The dark blue states are where DentaQuest business has operation. The orange are the safety net solutions and practice improvement networks are in the little green. So I really like, our, uh, we had a wonderful discussion yesterday about this patient-centered approach. And this is really how we think about the care patients receive at the Institute. The patient in the center, there is a dentist. We are not on the outside, at least in this diagram. And I have to say, I have lived this model of care at NIH, where we sat around the table and it was dermatology and neuroscience and behavioral health. We were all there trying to address the needs of that one patient. But how many of you think this is the reality of our providers? It is not. And we really need to start breaking those barriers and, and bridging that medical dental divide in order to, to the goal here is again, better, outcomes for our patient. And I, I really like what we came up yesterday at the table, patient-centered, but population-focused. Because what makes a difference for our patient, we also need to think about how it impacts the population. This is a really wonderful diagram of the impact on oral health on all systemic conditions. Pretty much everything under the sun is on this diagram. Um, just to tell us that this connection, uh, we need to take charge of making sure that this is well known in the medical community. We know it, we appreciate it. These are all clinical trials trying to answer these uh, correlations. So, you know, very difficult to talk about causality. Uh, but it's our charge to make sure that we bring oral health to the, to the, ta to the table. This was a brilliant paper um, just two weeks ago in JAMA on how much we are spending in the healthcare system in the United States. Dental is $112 billion a year. Think about that. I don't even know how much billion is. I'm just, you know, it is a lot of money and we are not getting the best outcomes we need. How many of you have seen this? Outcomes, yes, thank you. Uh, risk, uh, this is really where it all comes down to. Yes, we're spending all this money, but these are the outcomes we're getting. If you actually look at the life expectancy in the most developed countries, here's Chile, okay, here is Jordan and Switzerland. We are spending a lot and not getting the better outcomes that we need. And we need to keep in mind that oral health is part of this. The, the paper also outlined the highest spending per condition. And you can see, we made it here. It's number seven, okay? Diabetes is on the top. But how many, we know diabetes and our health are related, right? So we are connected in there, you know, we have evidence to suggest that better oral health would help reduce this. We are right here. And guess what? Here is the change. 1996, remember where you were. I, uh, and this is how much we spent 2013. Let's go back. 19, 1996, 230. Can someone tell me why 10 to 14 year olds are costing us $12 billion a year? 10 to 14 year olds. Any guess? Braces, okay. It's more than anybody 65 and other probably to combine together in this age group. That's a little, you know, we need to think about that. We really need to think about that. Can you tell me why we're spending for five to nine year olds, these are the kids I treat, two billion dollars. Two for one gender, together five billion dollars for what is actually preventable disease. Early childhood care is preventable disease because we have the models that work. And not only this, but in the map you see here, we don't uh, provide that access to everybody equally. This is access to dental services across the country. There's a big discrepancy, right? If you have not read this, I highly recommend it. I'm not going to go through all of this. This was a very, very well written report by the American Dental Association um, consulting group on what are the critical trends in dentistry. If we are going to talk about public health and the future of dentistry, we need to put this into the framework of our, our work. They've, they're spot on. Um, give me one and I'll, I'll, I'll look at it, but I don't wanna go through all of them. What should we look? People, providers, practice, policies, or payments? What is it? Say it again louder. Payment, okay. 
has nothing to do that DentaQuest somehow is engaging. <laughs> All right, here is the trend in payments. Payment for dental services is shifting from a commercial dental insurance to public coverage and personal out-of-pocket payment. Can anybody argue with that? No, this is the trend, okay? Commercial dental plans are increasingly using more selective networks, demanding increased accountability through data and performance measure and pursuing providers to reduce costs. Okay, I see a lot of nothing yet, so we'll skip the rest. You have this as a reference. It's really a great. And it is not getting better. This is the, the estimated dental spending um, in, in, till 2025. 20, We're here. We're here, okay? We're only going to be spending more and what we need to do is spend it better. Uh, what's really changing and why many people, this is this trend, private insurance is going to go down in terms of uh, pr proportion of the total payments and uh, public go up. And Medicare, I hope Medicare doesn't stay flat uh, I hope Medicare, uh, you know, people will recognize that when you turn 65, you still need good oral health and you need, still need to see the dentist. So, uh, but this is the trends and the prediction and basically they couldn't predict anything because there is no previous data. All right, so how do we choose this priority condition? Well, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. This has already been done in the medical world. In uh, 2010, the Medicare uh, group said, we're spending way too much money and we don't know what we're spending them on. They got together, they looked at the 95% of their Medicare spending was in 20 conditions. 95% of spending was in you know, 20 conditions. How does it look for dentistry? This is a typical uh, Medicaid program in millions of dollars. This is where we are spending our money. Early childhood care is zero to five. We know how to prevent that. We have all the tools in place how to prevent that. These here are the molars, the second molars, uh, the first and second molars of primary teeth and the molars of permanent teeth. We know what reduces these by 80%. It's called sealants. How many children get sealants? National average, 16%. And this is a soft, uh, white spot lesions. So let's get to the data and what the data tells us. This is work that I did with Tim Ayafalo, who's sitting here in the audience. Uh, we, put big, we put big data to the test. Does it provide clinically, clinically relevant evidence? You all have seen the pyramid of evidence. You know where the strong evidence comes from. You know about evidence-based dentistry. What do you think our colleagues rely on when they choose evidence? Which one do you think of these categories is the highest? Pick one and look if you, get, you were right. This is their evidence. This is a report by the ADA. We need to know what we're working with, right? So translating what we know works to the providers, it's not an easy task. And the fact that we know what works doesn't mean they're going to do it. And we just better accept that and come up with improvement strategies for dissemination and implementation. Okay, so do we have big data? We have big data. 70 million procedures per year, 22 million members. This is all of the DentaQuest Enterprise. Information, that first piece. Yes, information is you did a service, I'm gonna pay you, here's the money. Knowledge though, what's the knowledge? Efficacy versus effectiveness, and we're going to talk about this. Does it work in the real world? Okay, we know what works in a randomized clinical control trial. Does it work in the real world? And intelligence would be to support the improvement of care delivery and policy. If you have seen this, I won't go into detail, but we need to be very, very aware that there is a big difference between efficacy studies and effectiveness studies, right? The question is different. I have participated in clinical randomized control trial they take a lot of work, they cost a lot of money, they take a lot of calibration. Everything has to match and be ideal. You step outside in a dental provider's office, none of what you did in the clinical control trial is there. You know, you tell them you have to use rubber dam, you have to do this, this, this. They don't do that. They have, you know, some do, some do, but not all of them. 
So we need to be aware the setting is different, the question is different, the population is different, right? In a randomized clinical control trial, you select the people who meet your inclusion criteria to join that study. It's not, you know, sometimes it's random, but sometimes it's very strategically targeted. So we wanted to see what is the longevity of restorations. E cohort six years, so this is the beauty of data. You can look at six longitudinal years, 2.9 million records. Here is an example of what you can learn from big data and clinical outcomes. This child at the age of six received a two surface composite in August. In March of the next year, they received a pulpotomy and a crown. And in May, the tooth was extracted. So, it's very simple. You calculate the days between treatment one and treatment two, and you calculate the survival of that treatment. People have done this for many years, multiple treatments, drugs, etc. So we did this for dental uh, treatments. And if you don't have a second treatment, you censor them. Okay, then you create these survival curves. If they match, there is no difference. If they are different, there is a difference and you look at the days, and then you can do all this fancy statistical testing. So here's another example. Child four, sedative filling, then they got a pulpotomy, then they got a composite, then they got an extraction, and then they got a space maintainer. All in the course of two years. So for a six-year-old to lose 2J, if all of you are familiar, that is the second molar, right? Very important, space loss in that area is very hard to correct. You need a space maintainer. And then there are others. I won't go into that. You know, we're doing a, 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 but this case was really shocking to me. Uh, I mean, I, I have been in the OR. I know what treatments are done there. This child received eight pulpotomies and eight stainless steel crowns in one day at the age of seven. Age of seven. So age matters, comorbidities, we don't know them. We need to be very, very clear when we talk about big data. There are limitations, and we better be upfront about them. We don't know anything about these patients unless we have the full EHR record, their medication, and all of all that stuff, right? If you're only looking at claims, we don't know, okay? So the question was, do sealants work in primary molars? Can someone come up with a reason why they wouldn't work? Well, there were a few studies. So if you read the literature, uh, sorry, was the comment? They're not retained well, okay. They don't bond well, got hard to do, kids are you know, young. So these are the studies that actually have looked at this and they range between, oh, they work 73% of the time to they work 18% of the time. Well, if I was a funding agency, I am never going to fund a randomized clinical control trial to see the effectiveness of sealants on primary molars uh, with a rate of 18% success. It's wasted money, okay. So we need to look at other ways of, of looking at the data. Um, this is when people, or children receive these sealants. I think they, most of them receive them when they receive the sealants on the permanent mo uh, molar, at six years of age. But this is the data. Out of nine, uh, close to 10,000 sealants, we censored 9,000, meaning there wasn't a second treatment. 8.9% failed, meaning they had a second treatment of some sort. It could be anything. 8.9%. Can you guess what this number of failure is for resin restorations? Come on, surface resins. Wow. Very good. Who said that? Brilliant. You have seen my slides. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have a talk. Okay, and what you're actually seeing is the failure distribution only of these close to 9%, right? So if I was to present this, it would almost look like a flat lane, a flat uh, lane, um, because a very small proportion of them fail. But you can see how many of them fail their year one, year two, and start making really informative decisions. And this is by tooth number. Always it comes up, but does the tooth matter? Upper, lower, does it matter? It doesn't matter. Okay, if you do a good sealant, you probably do a good sealant on the bottom and on the top. So solid evidence that tooth doesn't matter, Age doesn't matter. Well, actually, age matters a little bit for sealants. Uh, in some cases, it doesn't matter for composite. If you do them younger, when they actually have the chance of being a preventative service, it works better, clearly, right? So if you put a sealant on a tooth that's newly erupted, 
it works better. And the same is true for six-year-old molars, right? If you put the sealant around six, of course it works better because there was no chance for the disease to develop. So age matters. Here are the two composite restorations. If you think amalgam in a, is on its way out, amalgam is on its way out. This is just a distribution of how many we get composites versus amalgams, okay? And this is for two surfaces. Amalgam is on its way out. Um, it probably still has a place, uh, but it's on its way out. What were you taught in dental school? Is there a difference between amalgam and composite? Let's see now. Who went to dental school? <laughs> We were told the gold standard is amalgam, right? It works better, it performs better on the long, long run, um, it, it moisture sensitivity, all of these things you've heard of. Well, the data doesn't tell us that. They work identically well. When we are talking about a single surface amalgam, that occlusal, they work perfectly well. But, you know, they, they work identically well. And this is based on 18, 000, oh, well, close to 20,000 restorations. You know, someone mentioned when you have a lot of uh, N in your sample, things really, uh, you need to take care of the significance because if you have a million patients in a cohort, everything will be significant, right? You need new models. But this is still in the range where I would say, well, 20,000. It was still not in that realm of millions of patients. Still valid, right? They work very well. And the only difference we saw is the upper first molar. Who here has placed a one surface composite on an upper first molar? Yes, okay. Do you believe that that may be true, that there is less survival in that tooth compared to the lower second molar? No. The data tells that. Is it going to hold true in every cohort or in your practice? We don't know but we need to give people the opportunity to look at their own data. And I think this is where my conversation ends, is we need to be able to do this. A provider should be able to do this in their own practice, okay? It doesn't matter that I know this about what they're doing, but it matters that they know what they're doing. I'm gonna speed up and um, sh show you the two surface composites. Again, we see difference in the upper first molars for two, sur two surface composites. Um, significant differences, okay? Now, this is my favorite one. How many, you, I see a few hands, so I'm assuming some of you have done pulpotomies. Parents today will come to the office and say, I don't know what you need to do, I want that tooth to look white, okay? You do whatever you need to do, as long as the tooth looks white, I am happy. And so what do our providers do? They end up doing pulpotomies and restoring these with a uh, white fillings, composites, okay? Now, if you read any guideline put by the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry, this is a no-no, okay? The golden standard is a steel, stainless steel silver crown, right? This is the data, okay? By year one, those that had a composite or amalgam are down to 50%. 50% have failed. Okay, by year two, 80%. Why are we, of course, everything works in year one. Everything works in year one. It's things that don't work on year two and three. And these are kids that are getting these treatments at age four, at age five, when they need this until they're 12. So, big data for clinical outcomes, it's a go. And we need to do that with every system you have and answer these questions in your own practices and uh, schools. The next one is a little bit more interactive, but uh, how many of you are familiar with the CMS 416? Oh, two hands up. This is public health. Am I in the wrong conference? <laughs> this is the only, I would say, the only statewide consistent for the last six years reporting on dental utilization of services for prevention, treatment, and providing services by a non-dental provider. And states are doing this. They're mandated to do this every year. And it comes from many states. I don't know if I'll call this big data. This is, this is small data. Uh, information, knowledge, where's the intelligence? It comes in a report every year, 150 pages of Excel spreadsheets for each state. Now you sift through all these numbers to come up with anything meaningful. It's a nightmare. 
These are the dental uh, measures, and they're reported in eight age groups. It's a beautiful set of data that we need to make usable. I want to talk a little bit about uh, a paper that's actually under review, uh, uh, the issue about access versus care. These are two different things, and we need to talk about this. Access is, was I able to get to the dentist? Care is, once I got to the dentist, did I get prevention, treatment, and all of this? These are very different questions. Access would be resolved by policy, decisions, reimbursement rates, you name it. Care is what the dentist does in the office is by addressing what the dentist does in the office and their training. So if you look at, this is a random state, I don't even remember the state. If you look at the access numbers for that state, for preventative care, just look at this purple, it, it, it hasn't moved, it's 41%. 41% of kids in that state had access to the services. But if you ask the question, of those that actually got to the dentist, how many of them got uh, preventative services? 89%. Our Medicaid kids are getting the best care possible, and we need to tell that story. These are hardworking providers, and we can't call them accountable. Oh, it's 40%. That's two different things. It's 40% because you don't recruit more providers who pay them more. But once they're in the dental office, things are really great. 90, 80 percent. All right, so I will switch gears and show you something that hopefully will get you excited about big data. And my last point on that list about usability of big data. This is that same data from all the 150 slide, uh, power, I'm sorry, PDFs that you get every year, organized in a way that's easy to use, easy to understand, and easy to communicate. So, let's do this, real time. What measure should we look at? You saw prevention. Do you want to see treatment? I'm not hearing any objections. Here is the issue that I mentioned, access versus care. So I'm going to go by access, because that, that is a good measure of access. Care would be asking a different question, so we'll apply access. And 90 days means that this is restricted to the children who had elig continuous eligibility for 90 days. It's the way it's reported. Okay, and what age group? All right, someone shouted age group. These are all the age group. Say that again? Three, under three, three to five. Okay, three to five, that's a good word. Apply, and let's look at all states. Here it is. Every state for the last six years in that measure in real time. So here you see ratio by state, treatment services, West Virginia and New Mexico. You get a report that gives you the national average. In every single state with their performance, the national average, And if you wanted to do something more, um, the table, the table with the data. So you can do this and do whatever else you want to do with it. So this gets to the issue of usability of the data, right? How are we making this data usable to all of our, to, to whoever, whoever the, uh, the end user is? Okay, I won't spend more time, but you can see the potential. I did this in one minute. You can do that in your, uh, practice or uh, the state or any agency that needs to know this information. What's also nice, I talked about communication and we deal a lot with this, communicating this. Um, it's important to have the tools to not reinvent the wheel every time. You can just click um, export and you can export it into your PowerPoint slides. Okay, and now you have something you can communicate um, and, and, and evaluate and, and talk about. Okay, this was the CMS 14. We are definitely not gonna go through all my little stories, but that's okay, um, we will do our best. So let's see. Okay, we're gonna move to an area that's very dear and near to my heart. 
uh, the treatment and cost of care in the uh, operating room. Yes. Okay. Um, it's right here. Oh, wait a second. This is very duplicate. Okay. There we go. So this falls into the medical waste, or what I call medical waste, and I will be the first one to say before I present a single note of data. There are patients who belong in our operating rooms, and there are patients who belong in our emergency rooms. Okay, this is my disclaimer. I've seen them there. I took care of them there. This is the best place for them to be. What we are talking here is those healthy individuals, thank you, um, who have, are going and using the emergency room because they don't have anywhere else to go. Okay, it's not because they really need to go there. Uh, so let's look at this. This is based on data from 37 pediatric hospitals. Every year we spend 170 to $160 million treating dental conditions in the operating room. Think about that. Think about it. In every case, the charges for that case are $10,000 for a single patient. How much dentistry can we do with $10,000? for how many children that need it. If you look at just the two to five year olds, that number goes to 62 million. The majority of these are young kids who are going there. Again, real dollars that we're spending, $3,000 in cash. This means this was actually what was paid, not the charge. The charges are always higher. They have like $10,000, but the actual dollars were close to $3,000. For $3,000, we can do a lot of preventive services for these children. This is just, what do we treat? We treat, you know, periapical abscess and dental caries and dental caries into the pulp and diseases of the lip. And what do we do? We put crowns, we put fillings, we put root canals, we do root canals and extractions. These are the services we do in the most costly setting of all, the operating room. And again, I, I, I need to say that in NIH, I only treat the kids in the operating room because the medical team is there. They're so medically compromised. This is the best place for them to be. So we ask the question, how many of these children were sick? How many of them had a comorbidity that made them uh, seek care in a pediatric hospital? Well, I'll tell you how many. Those with primary condition, only 33,000. And those with secondary, close to 5,000. So even if you add these two, let's say 10,000, out of 50, thousand children who were seeing in the operating room, only 10,000 were sick, meaning they needed to be there. Everybody else was healthy, had zero comorbidities, zero. Healthy two to five year olds. We need to do better. I don't have time to go through the emergency uh, story, but that was published in the Health Affairs, so if you want to look at them, it's a very, very good story. It is the story that we need to keep telling. And guess what? The data is not in our EDR. This is another issue I wanted us to really understand. The data in solving dental health public issues is not in the dental records. It's in the medical records, in the hospitals. And they have that. Okay, I'm gonna skip because I really wanna share a story about uh, in the last minute of ECC. So proud of our team. Um, we won't talk about measures, but this is really near and dear to my heart. So I wanna, I wanna pay tribute to the work that the Institute does. Quality improvement. This is small data. Pink now, emergency department, big data, small data. We can actually drive change. If you use the right models of, of, uh, in the right setting, we can drive change. I will never forget the first time I saw a run chart. Do you know what this is? Run? I, I know that we have uh, clinics from the collaboratives who've seen a lot of these run charts. I was like, what is this squiggly line? It doesn't make any sense. <laughs> it's up and down, what is all this? This is the real world. <laughs> this is what happens in the real world. So the problem is the early childhood caries and its treatment. The disease management protocol is putting in place everything we know that works. Learn, act, track, bring back, and these are the results. This is a five-year-old who was seen when they were three. 
and there, you know, with communication with the patients, with self-management goals, they were able to improve and reduce their risk. If I told you that this child is actually healthy, what would you think? How can that be? They have, you know, cherries, obvious on all their lesions. They haven't changed in three years. Mom is brushing, flossing, fluoridated toothpaste, for everything that needs to be done, this child gets. And nothing has changed in the last three years. And mom was not concerned about the aesthetics. Obviously, this was offered. If they wanted to do address this, it's available. But they chose not to. They did disease management. This is the collaborative, phenomenal work by our team. And these are the run charts. This is how we are able to get teams to do risk assessment for all of their patients, to set self-management goals, okay? We do great with these two. It's not very easy to do well on on-time visits, right? Patients are busy, they, don't, they need to come more often, um, and we've decreased the risk. This was really groundbreaking in our, in our opinion because we discovered the magical age by which if you don't see them, it's too late, 37 months. If you see them by after 37 months, the risk of new cavitation was so much higher uh, that, you know, it just, it was, it was higher. That's what we needed to take account. And this, you cannot see well, but just look at, look at these two lines, the orange and the blue. These were, this is the risk for children for new cavitation, okay, if they actually had a prior cavitation, and for new cavitation if they didn't have a prior cavitation. And now look at the orange and the yellow, which you can't see because it's so, there are a few data points. We change the trajectory of the disease. We don't, we don't remove the disease, we change the trajectory. We change the risk for new disease in the future by doing disease management. These are the run charts. We've also implemented them in Domo. So actually you can upload your files. This is click, 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 as I showed you, and you're able to see this. So I wanted to thank you. I hope you see how all of these are real uses of big and small data to drive the triple line forward. Thank you for your attention. Questions? I have a question. Yes, are please. those, um, all of those really wonderful visualizations with uh, the maps and charts and things like that, is that available to everybody? Can we go to a website and access those or? They are not, okay. they are not currently available, but uh, we are working on making at least parts of it available. Uh, and, and this I think is another issue is how do we make it available to everybody, right? Um, if you have any ideas, talk to me. I'm open and listen to listen. Uh, clearly there is a lot of value so let's find the best place and uh, to share them with who the users are. I think that's another thing is identifying the users. Sorry. Yes. Thank you. So you mentioned when you saw, uh, showed the longevity of restorations. Yes. How your disclaimer was we are looking at claims data. Yes. Right. And how you wi wished you know providers have these kind of reports for their own practices. And uh, we are in a position, we are like, you know, with our new study, we are getting data pr from network practices. Okay. And one of the goal is to share a report with them on longevity of posterior capacity <coughs> restorations and root canal treatments. Right. And um, one question I have is, do you have any suggestion, you know, on what you would have wished to have from the electronic dental records mm -hmm. that you are not able to get from the claims data? Thank you, what a great question. Um, obviously, the more we know, the better, but based on our experience with looking at the pediatric uh, hospitals, it's very important to understand if these children are chronically ill, if they have any comorbidities of any sort. So, you know, it's not, in kids, the, it's, it is about diabetes, but it's not about diabetes. You know, like we need to know uh, behavioral issues, um, just any medical condition that may impact the treatment choices we make, okay? Um, and then their risk, just the, the actual quantification of risk. How many, how, what do you, how many people do you think 
use risk coding, except in New York, which I am absolutely blown away, 100%. That is unheard of. But if you look at the claims, how many of the providers do you think actually submit a risk code? Just guess. Ballpark. Yes. Okay, don't be so pessimistic. <laughs> Any other guesses? It's, it's under 3%, okay? So, so, so <laughs> it's in the ballpark, I guess, plus or minus five. So very little. So if I, if I was able to add risk stratification to my data, I actually wanna know, because we know risk based on all the factors could impact longevity of restoration, I would want to know that. You know, so if you had to choose two, those would be my top two. Yes? Your own company rejects the data when it's actually submitted. Oh, risk yeah. Risk assessment uh, procedure code is submitted. Yeah. Because we will automatically mount it yeah. into the procedure codes, and it actually gets ignored. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I forgot to make my other disclaimer. I have nothing to do with EntiQuest. <laughs> I'm at the Institute. But I appreciate this. It's, it's a very important insight, right? Because we need to understand where the problem is in actually putting the right information fr from claims forward. And also um, bringing that information back to the provider. So you're absolutely right. And you know what? Why would a provider right now choose to submit a risk code? They're not paid for. Why would they do it? You know, if I had to click another box, for what purpose? First, it gets rejected by the system. Second, nobody pays me for it. What, I mean, why would I do it? So we know that providers actually track risk in their systems. What we need to communicate and understand is how important this is for the overall management of their population and make it part of the system that works well throughout. And we are working on this, but it's, it's as someone was saying here, big data, this is big data. This is hundreds and thousands of providers every day, hundreds and thousands of claims. So um, thank you for bringing that to my attention. Yes, please. So we know correlation works to prevent various uh, significant yeah. All the data that you showed, were those Medicaid uh, children? Well, all those Medicaid children? So for which part of the presentation? The All CMS 416 yes. is pure Medicaid. So right. that is only reported by Medicaid program. The longevity actually wasn't. The restoration survival was from non-Medicaid uh, patients. So I think a very interesting and important question is, what does this look in the Medicaid population? We, we run into a lot of issues with continuous eligibility and available of claims for that child through the years. But that's a great question to ask. And can you uh, stratify uh, the data by fluoridation status? We are, and this is in the manuscript that I mentioned. So we are looking at access, care, fluoridation of the state, any other access that has to do with dentists, number of dentists, and putting this in a very robust model to see what actually makes a difference. And if anyone wants to guess, I may be able to tell you yes or no. I, you have to wait for the paper. Are you doing fluoridation at the, at the state level or the local level? The state. That is absolutely a good point. The, the data is reported at the state level, so we have to go at that uh, unit, but you're absolutely right. I think we need to, how many of you know about uh, county health index? Write it down, yes, okay. Write it down because the, the bottom line is it happens at the county level. What I didn't show you with the emergency data County one in Maryland is not the same as county two in Maryland. Rural versus not rural, we need to start to think at that level of, of intervention and opportunity. But great questions. We just don't have that data for the CMS at the county level. Thank you so much for the great presentation. Thank Actually, you. you answered part of the question I was trying to ask when you said uh, there were Medicaid uh, uh, patients, the data that you have. But my question was if uh, the, most of the data come from urban or rural areas, because we, we know have, um, that so many children in the rural areas have a problem with access, quality of yes. care. And specifically when you mentioned disease management, the, the quality of hospitals or even medical centers they have is very low. So when you apply that to rural areas, children in rural areas is not gonna be very applicable. Thank oh, you. you're absolutely right. The picture in rural America is very different and we need to, we need to put that as a priority because if I have to drive three hours to the dentist and one hour to the emergency room, where do you think I'm going? I'm going to the emergency room. So rural access changes everything. And that's why one of the programs at the Institute is actually 
exclusively focused on rural communities and access to dental care and communicating with the medical providers, a lot of the uh, risk assessment can actually be done in a medical office if you train the people to do it right. So I don't want to take more time from the next speaker. I'm excited to listen. So thank you again for your attention. Thank you.